In 1978, E. coli bacteria were used to manufacture the first genetically engineered synthetic insulin. Since then, microbial manufacture and the use of recombinant proteins have become an extremely valuable therapeutic and diagnostic option for patients around the globe. Microbial fermentation is a key process in pharma manufacturing that is used to produce a wide range of biologic drugs, relying on microorganisms such as bacteria, yeast or fungi. It is particularly valuable for the production of smaller recombinant proteins, including antibody fragments and new types of antibody-like molecules. And while this area of biomanufacturing has been around for decades, advances in processes are still needed to improve process scalability, sustainability and product yields. When it started 40 years ago, uh, I think there was one fermenter and now it's very impressive that Lonza actually has become the biggest commercial CDMO in the microbial area. Today's episode will explore a topic that has truly transformed the entire healthcare industry, microbial manufacturing. This is A View On, a podcast brought to you by Lonza. To guide us through this landscape, I spoke with two of Lonza's leading experts in microbial R&D. First, we'll hear from Karl Heinz Flicker, Director of Microbial R&D, who will share the historical context and strategic vision behind Lonza's microbial capabilities. Later in the episode, I'll speak with Joan Cortada, an Associate Principal Scientist in Microbial Upstream Development, who will walk us through a real-world example of innovation in protein refolding. Let's begin with Karl-Heinz Flicker. Would you mind introducing yourself and your team a little bit to us? My name is Karl-Heinz Flicker. I'm head of microbial R&D. My team is um, located in FISP, and we do um, innovation around um, strain engineering, but also have more kind of process-related innovation projects um, ongoing, covering a USP and DSP as well. So for those who might not be familiar with the acronyms USP and DSP, could you tell us what they are and uh, walk us through what they mean in the context of microbial manufacturing? So USP is upstream processing, which generally means like um, fermentation, um, how to run bioprocesses when you um, produce recombinant proteins, which is the core of what we are doing in uh, microbial at Lonza. And DSB is uh, the subsequent step, which is then the harvesting and purification of the, the proteins of interest. The microbial fermentation capability at Lonza celebrated its 40th anniversary recently. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how did that make you feel in the grand scheme of things? I think it's generally very impressive that, uh, you know, a company uh, actually is uh, working with microbial expression um, already that long. And I think um, we've been uh, one of the first to use actually, uh, at least in a CDMO setting now, um, to use microbial expression systems at a very large scale. When it started 40 years ago, uh, I think there was one fermenter. And now it's very impressive that Lonza actually has become the biggest commercial CDMO in the microbial area. So we have um, um, large scale assets that are really um, serving our customers for, for commercial manufacturing. And uh, so it's really impressive that it actually started from, from kind of a very small initial project um, now to be really kind of a big business for Lonza. From your perspective, where would you see the field advancing towards? Generally, um, I would say the potential of microbial expression um, is really in the capabilities um, to actually express diverse molecules. Um, and in particular, if you compare it to mammalian expression, where it's largely dominated by monoclonal antibody um, manufacturing, because they have a platform process established with protein A purification. The opportunities for microbial are really that historically uh, we have covered already a lot of different molecules. So um, microbial, you could, could say it's more or less kind of established um, as, a, as a technology that can deal with a lot of different um, molecule types. And in particular, the upcoming 
non-FC modalities, which are, for example, nanobody formats, single chain um, FE formats, fabs, even like cytokines. So there's a lot of um, different molecules out there that are clinically relevant and where kind of larger manufacturing capacities are needed. So this is a, a place where, where microbial expression really can, can play a big role. So basically, if you have troubles expressing something, come to microbial, we've seen it all and we've done it all. Kind of. Well, you, you, you could say, <laughs> say that. Well, of course, I have to say that, um, you know, um, uh, microbial expression systems, um, and to be specific, um, Lonzo, we are currently working mainly with two expression systems. That's E. coli and uh, the PICI expression platform. These microbial expression systems, they are not as capable as the mammalian expression systems um, when you think about very complex molecules. So um, when, whenever uh, you have a lot of disulfide bonds, they, they are actually challenging for E. coli, for example. They could lead to inclusion body formation, whereas um, PICIA, for example, would be capable of also doing um, um, disulfide bonds and more complex molecules. So you mentioned E. coli and PICIA pastoris as two expression systems that Lonza Microbial is using. Are there any other systems that are used in the industry? or that we may be planning to expand into? There are definitely other expression systems um, out on the market, like uh, selfie ex expression, for example. Mm -hmm. So that is like, okay. a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a novel kind of um, emerging technology where you actually don't use active cells for the production and uh, expression of um, um, proteins, but you simply just use um, um, lysates from those organisms. And there's a, a currently, I mean, there's a, a huge variety of different um, cell-free expression platforms available. They range from also yeast-based systems um, to moss, like plant-based uh, oh, expression wow. systems. Yeah. Okay. With E. coli and PICIA being used the most, how do you introduce new expression systems and technologies into our processes? For us as a CDMO, it's really the challenge that we need to have um, kind of more established technology because pharmaceutical industry is very kind of risk adverse. So we need to, to, to be sure that um, uh, whatever we um, attempt is actually working the right first time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, whenever, you know, it's um, a new technology, there is more risk associated with it. And uh, the customers typically, um, because of course there's a lot of money involved, um, they, they are also very risk adverse. So they would, I think the tendency would always be there to opt for kind of the more safer options. I see. Okay. But I have to say that like R&D actually, I mean, uh, I think it's for us to actually showcase that new technology could actually um, be valuable also in a manufacturing setting. So far, we have reflected on Lonza's 40-year journey in microbial fermentation emphasizing the expertise with E. coli and PICIA expression systems, and the growing role of microbial platforms in producing a wide range of complex molecules. We also covered emerging technologies like self-free expression and the challenges of adopting new methods in a risk-averse pharmaceutical industry, with R&D playing a key role in proving their value. To bring this story down to the lab bench, Joan Cortada is joining us today as well. His work focuses on improving upstream processes, particularly the sustainable refolding of proteins from inclusion bodies. But before we get into the technical side of things, Joan, thanks very much for being here. Could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, I'm Joan Cortada. I originally come from Barcelona, from Spain, and... Yeah, I am Associate Principal Scientist in the Microbial R&D team at Lonza Visp in Switzerland. Thanks, Joan. You work in the upstream processing and focus on improving these processes. Can you tell us about your project and its impact? Yes, so our project is about improving inclusion body processes. So when we produce therapeutic proteins in E. coli, as Karl Heinz has already mentioned, we often end up with protein aggregates called inclusion bodies. So protein aggregates, could you explain a bit more about how they are formed during fermentation? So in microbial 
at least in Lonza, one of the main expression hosts that we use is E. coli. Uh, it's a bacterium that if you try to express a therapeutical protein in it, often it makes protein aggregates. So what you need to do when trying to purify it is you have to recover the aggregate and then you need to break open the aggregate, release the different monomeric proteins that are in it, and then you have to refold them. This process has certain disadvantages, so it's specific for each protein, actually. So it, it's time-consuming to develop specific process for your protein of interest. They require, usually, the gold standard way of, of uh, refolding proteins, or refolding inclusion bodies, rather. It's usually done with dilution refolding, which requires large vessels and large amounts of buffers. Yeah, this is the conventional approach, as, as I mentioned. So we are exploring at different things on how we can improve this process for both economical and environmental reasons. One way of using high pressure instead of this um, chaotropic buffers to break the aggregate, to solubilize your protein of interest and facilitate the refolding. We try to use smaller tanks. Ah, so an eco-conscious approach. By the way, you cannot even imagine how much I relate to what you just said. In my PhD here in Basel, I used to work with E. coli myself to express my proteins of interest. And I remember the nightmare of seeing inclusion bodies in my purified protein sample, right? I remember that we had to go through what you just explained, the environmentally not really friendly way of using, I think it was a trace buffer. You see, in order for the drug to work, you need the proper 3D structure of the protein. Since proteins consist of long chains of amino acids that are basically crammed together, their respective spatial positioning is really important for the activity of the protein. Think about it as a piece of paper with a poem written on it. Unfold it, you can read it without any issues, but if you squish the paper together, you create untidy folds and creases and a mishmash of words, really. Reading the poem this way is basically impossible and we lose all the meaning, right? So you need to unfold and straighten the paper again to be able to read it. That's essentially what we had to do with proteins and it was a real pain. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned how important the structure is. I mean, we've seen the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and uh, protein structure. And so it, it is really important and I'm sure listeners can relate to that. So you mentioned uh, high pressure. How do you facilitate high pressure on a protein? I assume we do not just sit on a sample. Yes, yeah, so we have actually done this work in collaboration with an external U.S. company. They have specialized equipment to provide this high pressure to the sample. So they have bench scale equipment that you can use to optimize the process, so to, to handle small amounts of sample, but they also have manufacturing scale um, equipment. So yeah, you need specialized equipment and then you can somehow pressurize a sample with pressurized air and special cylinders, etc. Yeah. And what is the interest within Lonza to apply this? So what kinds of proteins have you worked with? The proteins that we work with in microbial are usually in, um, immunoregulators, so cytokines, and with different hormones we can also work with all types of uh, therapeutics. Also, antibody fragments. Where do you see this field advancing? So I guess at the moment it's at the very early stage. When do you see this implemented on a, a larger scale within Lonza's microbial manufacturing? So we are investigating other aspects of inclusion body refolding technology, not only pressure refolding. For example, we are putting efforts on developing a high-throughput screening platform to... Um, a screen for conditions in a much more efficient and faster way. So you can find a sweet spot for each specific protein, yeah, very fast and in a much more comprehensive way, basically. So innovation here means moving forward on two parallel tracks. On one hand, 
enhancing the established state-of-the-art methods for solubilization and refolding through automated high-throughput development, and on the other, exploring emerging technologies like pressure refolding. But the push for innovation isn't always just about improving efficiency and yield. Karl Heinz, would you say the key driver is actually sustainability and reducing dependency on traditional methods for protein refolding? I think the technology is capable of um, really reducing um, the chemicals that are typically used for refolding, which, of course, uh, it's not only kind of a cost uh, effect that we would, would see, but also really um, from the sustainability perspective, it's um, a very interesting technology. And also, uh, um, the technology would allow us to have actually more concentrated feed streams in the downstream processing um, um, uh, process, which means actually that um, um, we need to process smaller volumes, potentially also um, limiting um, the loss of product um, throughout the, the individual um, processing steps in downstream. The pressure-based refolding technology actually can lead to higher yields. Traditionally, the uh, um, of course, depending on the protein, but traditionally kind of this um, dilution refolding uh, results in relatively low yields. But with the pressure-based refolding, we can actually really um, increase yield. Can you mention any numbers here? Sure, I can take this, this question. It really depends on the protein of interest, but the most recent one we tested, we achieved about 2.5 times higher concentration with uh, protein refolding. 10 times reduction in the amount of chaotropic agent required. So you can see that the, the concentration of protein was significantly higher, and that in turn results into, as Kohais has mentioned, a more efficient downstream processing with less losses and smaller equipments. Mm -hmm. So No, I mean, it sounds really like a way to go if you think about it from the sustainability perspective. It's not anymore something that is nice to have. It's something that is really informing the decision-making process when processes and partnerships are selected. So well, we hope so too. <laughs> yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me today. It was really an informative discussion and it took me down the memory lane really back to my PhD time. So I really do appreciate that too. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thanks for listening to A View on Microbial Manufacturing. Join us next time and learn about something really exciting, spray drying mRNA-based products for inhaled delivery. If you cannot wait, head over to lonza.com forward slash a-view-on to listen to our previous episodes. You can subscribe to never miss an episode and access additional materials and interview info. Bye for now. <laughs>